libraries are all about books. Rows of books, stacks of books, people checking out books. At least that's what, rem what we remember. <laughs> my ambition today is to share with you why there's so much more than that. But first I want to tell you my story. I was raised in a small rural community about an hour away from a city of any size. There's nothing unique really about growing up in a small town. But what was unique about my childhood, perhaps, is that I was raised in a small fundamentalist community where my information environment was tightly controlled. I was homeschooled, different, secluded, but very much loved. On rare occasions, my mom took us to our local public library. And it's in this library that I discovered the first book that would have a profound impact on me, besides the Bible, of course. I loved this book. I <laughs> underlined, I highlighted, I turned down the corners of pages, I even wrote my name in it. I <laughs> checked it out as many times as I could, and then I stole it. I just simply could not let this book go. These words, I, I wish to live deliberately, they became my words, my mantra, in fact, for uh, the possibility of a world or a life beyond the very small world that I was a part of. These experiences instilled in me an uh, incredible conviction for equal opportunity and for the, the possibility of a moment where you realize that the world is bigger than what you've known and you have a choice about how you're gonna be a part of it. So fast forward a decade or so and I'm in college, then grad school, <coughs> then library school. And quite honestly, I went to library school with the libraries of my childhood and universities in mind. I thought that I could get paid to sit in a room like this one and help people find things <laughs> to read. But <laughs> boy, was I in the, for the surprise of my life because this was also the first year that my library school was adapting its curriculum to the incredible changes of personal technologies and digital formats on all of our lives. A few years after library school, I joined OCLC Online Computer Library Center, a global cooperative of library agencies that work together to advance librarianship. At OCLC, I lead a team that manages an online community for library staff that helps them get the information and the resources that they need to do their work. And then more recently, I've had an uh, incredible pleasure of working with the Global Libraries team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a strategic advisor. And in all of this work, I see and support firsthand every day libraries all over the world meeting today's community needs and doing so much more than storing books. So a few examples. Let's start with the obvious. If libraries are about books, well, e-books are books. And if you are a resident of this city and have either a city or county library card, as of last month, you also have free access to more than 25,000 ebook titles on your Kindle or your Nook. If you have access to the internet and a PC, you can also get to more than 20,000 local, regional, national, international magazines and newspapers and all of their content. That's not to mention the growing collection of digital music and film. But providing access to digital content isn't really innovative, honestly. It's, it's just keeping up. At the U Media Lab in Chicago, a 5,500 square foot room on the first floor of the downtown branch of the Chicago Public Library, teens with a library card have access to more than 100 laptops, video games, Wii, flat screen monitors on every wall, a recording space, uh, a recording studio, excuse me, <laughs> a performance space, and even can check out digital equipment for personal use. 
in this library the, the skills required to, to participate in a digital age as a worker or as a citizen, things like generating content and critiquing it, not just consuming it, are not only valued, they're, they're actually instilled. But 21st century skills aren't just for teenagers. There are 25 million or so people who are either underemployed or unemployed in this country, and for many of them, the library is their only source of support. In Westfield, Wisconsin, a small town where unemployment is in the double digits, Marie Bowman, the director of the public library there, talk, talks about helping her small rural community residents do things like use a computer or software for the first time, uh, use resume templates, uh, look up a company <laughs> on the web for the first time and even apply for jobs. <sighs> her customers come back to the library and tell her how they're doing. Just this morning, she says to me, one of our regular customers who's been using our computers for months and attended one of our job seeker programs met me at the door of the library to tell me that he starts his new job next week. Let's look beyond <laughs> Thank you. Let's look beyond our borders to Veracruz, Mexico, where the majority of communities are small, rural and poor. One program there uses 24 all-terrain buses to bring technology and education to remote areas. The buses are loaded up with laptops, satellite internet, uh, interactive whiteboards, uh, projectors, and even uh, backup generators. The bus stays in a community for two weeks. It's staffed by highly trained people who uh, teach technology skills, build community, and even shore up local access points. When Maria Rivera learned that the bus was coming to her area, she thought it would be a great opportunity for her kids, but she actually found herself in the classroom. Through the program, she got online and got into regular contact with her husband, who'd been living and working abroad for more than eight years. Afterwards, she set up a webcam. This program, she says, <laughs> helped my children know their father. Through the webcam, he was able to see them grow. This is the future of library service, meeting our users exactly where they are, wherever they are. In Denmark, government policies for community engagement actually govern all municipal projects. And in Aarhus, Denmark, this is called participatory democracy in practice and it requires that users are involved at the beginning of every project. Using this model, the public library in Aarhus prototyped the library of the future with their entire city as co-creators. They asked their citizens, when everything is online, why come to the library at all? They used hundreds of user-generated design techniques to get to the answer to this question. My favorite sessions are with the kids. We've asked a lot of grown-ups, they say to the kids, but it's you who will decide. That means you get to do what you want, and everything is allowed. Their answers became the design for Urban Media Space, a new model for a public library that provides for open, flexible spaces and a focus on networking and collaboration. Oh, and sound. The kids said they wanted to hear the sounds of the forest when they approached the shelves with the books about trees. <laughs> in all these stories, the vital role of the library in any community is evident, and this is happening all over the world. With access to content, space, and service, the library helps individuals become effective members of their community. And when the library provides that opportunity to anyone, it becomes opportunity for all. Now, if you haven't been in a library recently, you may not know that library use has surged due to new needs 
and a deeper divide between those who have access and those who don't. Last year, there were 1.6 billion visits to a US public library. We don't even have stats for the globe. One in three Americans used a library's computer or internet access. 43 million Americans use that access, like Maria, specifically to, contact, to get in contact with friends or family. And another 30 million use that access to get help with a job search. At the same time, libraries closed in 17 states last year. Many more reduced their hours due to budget cuts. And even when they are open, libraries, 80% of libraries use things like wait lists or, or time limits to meet the demand from their communities. Imagine not having a computer or internet at home or work, no web-enabled mobile device and you have to stand in line or watch the clock while you look for a job or even research a health concern. We simply cannot let this be. So what can we do? We can certainly visit our local library, talk to a librarian, start a conversation about the library in your community. You can call your public officials and tell them why the library is important to you. And the next time you're in a ballot box, you can vote yes for libraries. All of these things are important. I hope you will do them. But in my view, they're also short term. At best, they support the libraries of our childhoods, not the libraries we need today and into the future. And so I'll ask you instead to join me in asking more communities to answer the question that Aarhus posed to its citizens. When everything is online, why come to the library at all? The library of the future most certainly is not about storing books. But what is it? Well, we get to decide. That means we get to do what we want. And everything is allowed. Thank you. <laughs>